another Trinity Entrepreneurs Society webinar series, and today we are with James McCormack, uh, the Modern Day Entrepreneur. So, I'm very grateful to have you with us here today, James. I was saying to uh, off camera that, um, or prior to recording, that the talk that you gave to the Trinity Entrepreneurs Society three years ago still sticks with me to the point where, when I was asked to create some form of list of speakers like James McCormack, top of the list, I'm glad you're here. Thanks, mate. Well, thanks very much. It's always nice to hear that. I remember that talk. Um, I think Donica, who's in the room as well, was there. Um, when you're talking about your entrepreneurial journey, you can always get a, well, me anyway, it can always get quite emotional because it's, it's a bit of a roller coaster. And, yeah. it continue, and it continues to be, but that's part of the fun of it, I suppose. Yeah, for sure. I like, and your story is amazing. And I can't just wait. I can't wait for, to hear it again, really, just for myself personally. I'm just looking so, forward. So how long do we have? An hour, is it? An hour. Uh, there, okay. there, and it's mostly for your sake that I kept it to the hour. And we yeah, hundred percent. Um, so, uh, assuming the background for all the guys in, in the room, what there's thirteen guys. They're all studying at the moment in Trinity. This yeah. is a, a passion of theirs, of yours. Who are watching? Um, so yeah, I'll just I'll just talk about my story quickly. Um, I like. I'm, I'm pretty honest, I'm pretty open. So um, uh, in 2009, uh, November the 4th, I think well, 2009, I officially launched my first business, uh, which was Good Mood Food. Uh, it was a, a catering company. Uh, prior to that, I was working as a mortgage broker. And prior to being a mortgage broker, I had a, a series of failed jobs, um, which was, it was difficult to take. I went traveling in 2004 when I was about 24 uh, to India and I came back um, and I had a series of jobs, worked for Sherry Fitzgerald, got fired, worked for a KBC Bank, got fired and worked for my first more sales job in a mortgage brokerage and I got fired after six months for not bringing in enough sales. So you're, you're, I was 26 maybe um, and I was, you know, not doing, not doing too well. Um, I suppose is the way that you look at it. Um, historically, in my family, my father was an entrepreneur slash Del Boy style, kind of old school um, island hopper who went from uh, London to Dublin to uh, Cape Town, um, doing different odd, odd kind of jobs, always evading the tax man um, and managing to, to build a house down in Westmead in cash, uh, three and a half thousand square foot house. That was the type of character he was, whether he did it all legally or not, I don't know. <laughs> uh, he has since passed away, so I never really got to drill him down and that type of stuff. So, um, but my first kind of breakthrough job came in sales. A friend of mine was working as a mortgage broker. It was the, the boom, you know, so looking back, probably anyone could have done this job and, and succeeded. Um, so we were selling financial services and I because I had so many failures, I kind of came in with a chip on my shoulder to do really well. I got hired by this, the, probably the biggest mortgage brokerage in the country, which is called Irish Mortgage Corporation. And I went in like a hungry animal. And uh, the way they do things in there is every Friday, they publish a league table. And there was about 50 salespeople in the company. And they'd publish your standing in the league table, like the, like the football Premier League table. And you'd see where you were. It's very demoralizing to see yourself kind of at the bottom end of that table. Um, but I went in there, I was one of, always one of the first to arrive, um, always early, first to arrive, hit the phone straight away. I couldn't believe that they were giving me this uh, database of people um, who I could just call and solicit for business. Um, I would send emails, I would call, I would, uh, I would do everything I could and sales started to flow in. And within six months, I was one of the top sales guys in the, com in the company. And that kind of gave me a lot of... Um, uh, gave me a lot of confidence I suppose a huge amount of confidence um, and so but unfortunately in 2008 uh, December 2008 I was made redundant so you know it wasn't you don't feel so bad being made redundant when not necessarily your fault the crash came the company went bust it went from 200 people to five people in the space of two weeks or something like that but that was me then um, I had no money I was uh, 29 years old just bought a house, uh, a mortgage that I got, managed to get at the, get at the top of the market. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, so there was a lot of pressure. I didn't have kids at this stage yet, but then is the next question, what do I do? You know, I'm kind of, I could get a sales job. There wasn't many jobs. 
I'd always harbor the ambition to work for myself. And that was what I always wanted to do. And I, but I didn't know how to do it. Okay. Mm. Um, and in December, 2008, I got a job for three months with a guy um, selling healthy school lunches. Uh, he was actually a guy who I worked with. And then my brother doing paint jobs. And then in April in 2009, I um, uh, put the name Good Mood Food uh, together and I created my first company. Um, my first business name, I wasn't even a company. I was still a sole trader at that time. So yeah. we, can, we can talk about the pros and cons of being a sole trader versus a limited company. And um, I had no money. I was absolutely broke. I was a bit depressed, but I wanted to start this company. And, this, and the company was Good Mood Food. It was going to be a sandwich delivery service. And the only reason why I chose that business was because my wife, my now wife, Linda, uh, gave me a loan of 500 euros and she backed me. Nice. Um, God, why do I always get emotional when I? <laughs> why wouldn't you, man? Why wouldn't you? Like, yeah, but you, it's. Well, what, what you created since and that, that hardship prior, and your wife, now girlfriend at the time, or fiance, giving you that, you know, sign of support and, and backing you, yeah. you know, and giving having it that was, <clears throat> You know, yeah, but amazing. But so she gave me five hundred euro, and that was it. Um, go for it, she was basically saying. And so, so for five months, I made loads of spreadsheets. I did a lot of research, um, but I didn't start the business until she basically said, you got everything now, um, just do it. So she actually pushed me over the edge. She pushed me off the cliff. Um, I had subbed out a kitchen in Still Oregon. Um, I was allowed to use that kitchen from 5 a.m. in the morning to like 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. or something like that. And I went in not having a clue how to make sandwiches, did all my due diligence bits about, you know, getting stock and all the rest of it. Um, and I did the one thing that I was good at. I uh, knocked on doors and I sold, sold myself, I sold the business. And, you know, within uh, a couple of weeks, three weeks, let's say, I had a round going around San for Industrial Estate where I would email the company, tell them what time I was coming at. I'd walk into reception. Um, with a, a tray full of bath, uh, sandwiches. Um, I was driving a five series BMW that I used to park around the corner because I was too embarrassed about my lack of professionalism. And I started selling sandwiches for about 250 a pop and I started making money. I mean, the first day I took 17 euros um, and I wasn't, I wasn't upset by that. I was like, I couldn't believe that somebody would actually hand over their hard-earned money and give it to me and I would give them back a very average sandwich. <laughs> um, but, and then for, I did that for six months um, and I absolutely loved it. And I, you know, I was doing individual sandwiches, selling them into uh, corporates in, in Sandiford Industrial Estate. Um, I hired my first guy, who was a Chinese guy, absolutely awful. His name is, I never forget his name, is Sphinx. Um, do you know the way the, they, you know, um, Chinese uh, guys come in, they have to take an English name. A lot of them do anyway. Yeah. And he chose Sphinx, Sphinx which I always will never, will never forget. Um, so I lasted there. Basically what happened, I got so busy in that place that the, the woman essentially kicked me out um, and said, look, I, I'm giving you a month's notice. Because you were doing too well. Because I was taking over, I was encroaching on my time. She had only given me until 11 o'clock and oh, suddenly okay. I was there till one o'clock. So basically, basically what I was doing was I, I built I 500 euros. I built a 200 euro website, which is, which is so basic. Um, I, I built, I bought the rest on stock and stuff like that. And I was paying her hundred euros a week. And I was there, I was growing and growing and growing. And I was like, I was making 400 sandwiches a day by myself and delivering them all by myself. And I was, I was actually really, really good at it in the nice. end. Um, but then it came, to, that's kind of the next stage is where I uh, basically got kicked out. I had to find a place. And luckily, my brother is working commercial properties. He knew a guy who was offloading a coffee shop, which was very, very common uh, at the start of the crash. So yeah. this business, this business, remember, was the, the worst economic downturn of our time. Um, and at that stage in 2010, I moved into, I managed to take, it was actually the most, you know, crazy story. I met this guy on a Wednesday and I was operating a 60 seater cafe the following Monday. And that was how I got involved in coffee. And, but I wasn't really interested. I didn't care about coffee. Plus I knew nothing about it. I was only interested in um, the sandwiches. Um, they had a little kitchen that I could continue my little operation. So by then, um, 
my car had gotten repossessed. My five series BMW was repossessed. Um, I'd scraped together two grand in cash from the business to buy a really shit um, uh, fridge van. Um, got it branded uh, for like 300 euro or something in all pink. So it really stood out on the road called Good Mood Food. And I'd landed a contract with an Italian bank that wanted 70 pack lunches a day to all their staff. It was nice. worth it was worth about 10 grand a month. I, I oh, just, wow. Um, How did you land that? It was kind of inherited from the business, but the, the, the guy I took the coffee shop over, but they thought I was going to flop straight away. But I managed to keep it for about a year and a half oh, until, they, um, until they started to farm out looking for different suppliers. Um, but essentially, Good Mood Food was my, my kind of foray into business. And let me tell you, every single mistake you can make in business, I made it um, for a number of different reasons. Um, but, you know, I was, was quite ignorant. I was probably a lot of it was inherited from my father. Um, but I but think I was, all starting off with anything, especially entrepreneurial stuff, you're not taught this stuff in school. So we're all making mistakes as we go. But that actually was the next question I was going to ask you, James, that you're looking back on it now, and there are definitely people going to be in this room that, you know, would be interested in setting up their own businesses in the future. And um, some like very soon. What would be the maybe the mistakes that you would have learned or the lessons that you could have might have learned the hard way that if you were to, you know, pay that forward and pass it back to those who are maybe just starting on the journey that they mightn't necessarily have to make those errors that you can learn from other people or learn from your experience. If you were to say two or three things. Yeah, I would say personally, I was overconfident, um, probably to the point of arrogance. Uh, in terms of everything just kind of kept on rolling into my path and going really, really well. Um, and I was making money, um, but I didn't know if I was making any profit or not. I was kind of ignorant to that. Uh, I, I suppose the tips I would say is that, you know, build your, start, take the advice that's in front of you, get advice. Um, come, if you're looking to open a coffee shop, for example, go and talk to someone like me who's got 12 years experience, I don't know. Talk to somebody, find out the basics, do some training. Um, you know, I was, I learned, you talk about learning everything the hard way. I learned everything the hard way. I didn't even employ an accountant. I paid all their staff cash. I um, did everything the wrong way. And I only, the only thing that put manners on me in that business sense was being audited by revenue to absolutely slap me across the face um, and find me quite heavily for not basically doing things properly. I ended up owing them 12,000 euros, I think, in uh, unpaid PAYE, which is your, your taxes for um, paying wages. And uh, for a long story short, they ended up charging me, they got to 40,000 um, for it. So that was quite kind of scary. And I was very, very angry about that uh, happening in the first place. Um, but from, it's a humility thing. Um, you know, I didn't understand myself. I didn't know who I was. I had no respect for people. Um, I had, I, I, I get on with people, but I under, you know, to myself, I had no respect for my staff. Um, and I didn't probably treat them that well. You know, uh, your true feelings always kind of become uncovered. And like, that's a, that's a big kind of, we just had a staff meeting tonight. We have a team of 15. And, you know, I still talk to them about our culture and about what a great team we have and, you know, about this business isn't here to exploit people, it's here to make them better. Um, like these are all the things that, you know, I'm telling my current team that I'm still learning, that I've learned from those uh, periods. And like the, the really important thing is like you're, you want to build a strong team and a team that respects you. And the only way you can team, build a team that respects you is if you respect them back. Um, so I respect and, and take care of our team as best as possible. I pay them as, as well as I can pay them. I, when we're scheduling their weekly work, I make sure that they're not being overworked and making sure they're not traveling too far distances. We make sure they're not working too many weekends. Um, all these little small things that go a long way to building a really strong team. Um, and that's, you know, like obviously starting out in business, I mean, you're not really thinking about the culture of your team or your, um, but I suppose, if you go back to your original question, um, it's sort yourself out, get to know yourself. Um, it's, you know, you think you know a lot more than you actually do, when you, especially when you're early in your kind of late twenties. Um, you think you know a lot, but you don't know anything. Yeah, I get that. 
and the more right. you know, the more you realize how little you know. You know yeah, more- like, uh, and you know, I think one of the things to go a bit deeper on things that I'd lost both my parents, um, that kind of in the few years preceding that business, and that really had a, 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 an unnoticed effect on me, like you have these traumatic events in your life um, and you don't know how to deal with them. And often the way we deal with them is by taking our anger out on other people and being dismissive and being negative and being angry and, you know, uh, using alcohol to soothe the, the anger. These are all things that I did anyway. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, you know, that doesn't make for a, a good business operator. It doesn't make for a good, uh, it doesn't make for a good entrepreneur, um, let me say that. So, and that, I didn't learn that until, you know, a long time after. Yeah. Um, to the point where I go to psychotherapy regularly because it's really, really important Man. to talk to somebody and to, you know, understand why you act like that. And the only way you can fix yourself is by understanding and also creating that self-awareness about, you know, if you're, if you're operating in business, you need to have unbelievable self-awareness because you're dealing yeah. with so many different things, so many different types of people, so many yeah. different, um, you know, across the board, not just your team, but your suppliers, the people you're selling to. Um, and if people sense you, your lack of self-awareness, they won't do business with you. Um, and that may sound strange, but that's no, the, conclu- the, the, no. the conclusion that I'm coming to anyway. Yeah. Um, so, but... That's a life thing, you know, and, you know, do people pay attention to it? I don't know, but, you know, I'm 41 now and I'm, I'm still just figuring that out, you know, and if I had somebody telling me that and oh. pushing me into it when I was in my mid twenties, maybe life would be a bit different. Oh man, and like, I say this all the time as well, and it's like, it's such a pain that we've learned that things the hard way and we don't necessarily, because these are truths. These are just truths that we'll all have to experience. And sometimes you can experience them a good better, but ahead of you and may not have to go through the same stuff. So. That's awesome advice, man. And it's, you know, oh, more, more than a- I'll continue on with the story. I like to, my, my business story is kind of like, starts getting a bit wild now because as part of that arrogance that I had, everything was going well for me. 2011, I landed a, a job uh, running Bill Cullen's kitchen out in, um, in t- uh, Swords. Um, so he is a, he had a huge place out in Swords, Bill Cullen, for, for any of you who knows, he used to, he's a very famous Irish entrepreneur, he used to be a multimillionaire and he went broke there um, in 2000 and I'll say 15 or something. But anyway, I landed a, a gig with them where I was operating their, their commercial kitchens and I was serving, geez, we're serving at one point hundreds of people per day, like actual hot food, serving them in a kitchen. I woke up one day and I was I was I was I was a chef preparing fish pie for like a hundred delegates in this place one day and I'm not I'm not a chef let me tell you. But you're gonna make um, it. Sound, you're gonna make but it. That's, but that's the confidence or or, or overconfidence that yeah. I had. It's like nobody can do this better than me. Um, so I'm gonna do it. <laughs> um, and it was it was actually it was look, it was an amazing experience. Um, and. I, at that stage, I had two vans on the road. I was, I, was I, I guess I was employing 20 people. I was, I was one of the biggest sandwich operators in the city. I didn't even know it. Um, and I was getting a lot of more gigs with corporates as in big sandwich platters. I was, we were doing five, six, 700 people per day, I think maybe more even. Um, and like, I didn't even realize that I was on this really, really good business. And I just thought it was a shit little business, to be honest with you. I was like, this is a sandwich business. No, this is, you know, this is, you know, no, who cares about it? it was all you're reading about is Elon Musk's doing massive tech stuff and you're running a little, your elbow deep in mayonnaise. And, <laughs> um, but you know, if I'd only known what I was on to, you know, I could have created something much, much better. But I had, a, I had a huge lack of focus um, and a friend of mine came to me and said, did you ever think about running coffee courses? And I said, no, let's do it. Like just straight away like that. He came to me. I said, let's do it. Um, and we were kind of cowboys. That's, this is the start of Dublin Barista School. So don't tell anyone that we were cowboys back then. But um, I did, I did <laughs> go to London. I did, I did go to London and I did do a, a really, really good coffee course over there. I came back when we started Dublin Barista School. I was obviously the barista trainer. It was no one else was going to do it. 
And that business started off just smooth. Once a month, we built, again, a 200 euro website. We used the same, I used the same guy I used to build up my other 200 euro website. Um, and, you know, just uh, going back to my Good Mood Food website, this rubbish uh, website, I was taking in, there was no online payment systems, but I was taking in 100 individual orders per day on it. And I was, I was, I was printing all the orders off and I was making them and I was delivering them myself, plus another 200 I was selling or 300, whatever it was, I can't remember. Wow. Um, it was just like, it was the start of, it was almost like an e-commerce business. <laughs> yeah, <I don't> <laughs> So then we started Good Mood Food. That was just an easy, lovely business. Um, and, you know, we were once a month training people and that kind of just kept on going and we used that cash to start another business. So my friend said, did you ever think about, um, okay, let me take a step back. Um, that, that woman who kicked me out of the kitchen, right? Um, I was telling you about Good Mood Food. I was there for six months or nine I months. I literally kicking you out of the kitchen, by the way. Like, yeah, know. she basically sort of did. Um, and I don't remember how I felt about it at the time, but I remember when my mother passed away in 2011, I was really, really emotional. Um, and I was, my father had passed away a couple of years before that. I had this strong sense that I had to look after my family. I, I have one younger brother uh, and uh, three older siblings, two brothers and a sister that are much older than me. And I had this sense that I had to become the man of the house. You know what I mean? Even though we had no house anymore, like we had no family, family nucleus. So I had like, I think I, I, I went back to her and I said, I knew she was in financial trouble, this woman, and she wasn't doing well. So I said, look, I went out to her, arrogant as, as you want, and said, I'm going to buy your kitchen off you. Um, and I handed her 10,000. No, I said, I'll give you 8,000 euro cash. Um, and that's what I did. And I took over the kitchen without any business model um, or thought behind it. Because I was kind of angry and I was, I, I thought this was going to be a help, a way for me to propel myself into the next stage with the sandwich business. But in actual fact, all it did was give me an extra expense. Um, was I obviously taking on a lease? I was being very, very aggressive, but there was no real strategy behind it. Um, my friend came to me and said, why don't you, my same friend that I started Dublin Breeze School with, why don't you start a Mexican, why don't we start a Mexican? Because Mexican food was all the rage. And that's what we did. I essentially closed down my sandwich business that was going really well to focus on this new Mexican idea. Um, and essentially the Mexican business went really well uh, for a period um, until we realized that we were terrible at managing restaurants. Um, and we got ourselves into about 20 grand worth of debt with revenue because we weren't, simple reason is because uh, we weren't managing our, our business in any way or shape or form. I assumed people were stealing from us, but the hard truth was that we were just really bad business operators. This was 2013, 2012, 2013. Um, and it all started to cr crumble, um, really. Everything started to crumble. Um, 2013, we managed to move into South Ann Street, where I am now, started the barista school, took on more. Like, if you can imagine running, um, I was up at 5 a.m. every single morning to go into the sandwich business to check up and everything to make sure all the orders were being done um and then i'd be working until half 11 at night in the um in the mexican business uh so i was working from 5 a.m to 11 30 doing that kind of non-stop i absolutely ripped the life out of myself um couldn't think on one thing i there was no deep thought there was no there was no strategic thinking there was no higher level thinking it was all where am i where am i going now where am i going now who do i have to pay where am i going what's next i was going from slorg into tala to um swords back into the city center back to slorg and it was just mental um and i had my first child then in 2014 and the whole my whole business world kind of collapsed then in 2015 my I fell out with my partner um, I had zero money. I wasn't paying myself anything, um, really, like very, very small wages. Um, somehow my wife was, you know, keeping us afloat. <clears throat> um, and in 2015, I had to basically shut down everything. I liquidated the Good Night Food. I liquidated El Porco Loco. Um, it's a real, it was a real dark period for me. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, it was also the best thing that could ever happen to me uh, as well because it taught me so much, it taught me so much. Um, if I talk about that 20 grand revenue debt that we owed, it was because um, we were turning over a good money, like a lot of money. Um, 
but it was equally flying out of the bank account because we weren't managing anything internally. There was no quality control. If you, if you think of yourself, if you've ever ordered a burrito and you go into your favorite burrito joint one day and they overfill it, you're thrilled. You're like, oh my God, they just made a huge burrito. That's amazing. The next day you go back, it's underfilled. And you're like, yeah. oh, that's shit. Um, okay, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. The next day you go back, it's, it's filled the way it should have been, but it's still not the way it was overfilled the first time. <clears throat> so you're still not happy. So you never come back to us. Yeah, you, yeah. You've given us up. So it was no management in the kitchen. We were, there was no uh, quality control. There was no quantity control. There was no, we were, myself and Simon were so tired. We just couldn't do it. And we, and we didn't know how to do it either. Yeah. Um, and so I remember that was the first day I really built an incredible stock control spreadsheet. I sat there for a week. Every morning, I got a guy who was working with us to come in with me at, at 6 a.m. every morning to do a daily stock count. If anyone's ever done a stock count of a kitchen, it's an absolute pain in the ass. Um, and I, I discovered that it was me. Um, it was me who was at fault. But I looked at the figures and said, it's not the, it's not the chefs. It's our systems are all wrong. We didn't have any systems. And that's when everything changed. Even though I had to close that business, that's when everything changed for me um, in terms of, I know how to run a business now. This is how we run a business. And um, we, we started making the changes. We, we um, gave guys the training. We got in weighing scales. We, we showed them how we wanted everything done. Um, and suddenly our business started going really well um, in Stillorgan. At this time, we only had one shop in Stillorgan. We were approached by a guy in the square in Tala and said, I love your brand. I love what you guys are doing. Will you come out and take my unit and you'll get three months rent free at the start. I'll kit it out for you. And I said, this is a dream. And we like Tala, Tala is the mecca of food. It was like Domino's pizza. I think it's the busiest in Europe out there. Wow. Um, and we were like, this is unbelievable. How every, like in our heads, everything was changing for the better. But we went out there and we did an amazing, like we did a really good job in the place. Um, and we were, had all our systems in place and we had a really good team, but we couldn't get people to walk in the door. We just couldn't get anyone in Talit to walk in. We were the only people, we were, we were the only business in the history of Talit to get the place open so we could do evening deliveries. Um, but that still wasn't good enough. We did a 10,000, uh, a 10,000 flyer drop around Talit at a 50% discount, which normally would be everyone's all over it. We got, we got two people back. Oh, wow. Um, why, do, why weren't people coming in? I still don't know. I just think we, uh, Mexican food was ahead of its time for Talib, possibly. Okay, yeah, <laughs> um, I'm a, a roaring trade. Yeah, look, understand, <laughs> but I guess. Uh, yeah, but like, it, was, it, was, it was huge financial pressures and I couldn't meet um, the demands of, of, of Talib and Talib ultimately shut us down. Um, and what I was left with, I was left with South Ann Street with Dublin Barista School that was teetering along. We were doing about 60 to 80 coffee sales a day on our bar. We were filling about two, maybe three days of training a week. Um, and they weren't even full classes. We were just treading water. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, that, and that wasn't any fault of the business. It was just because we were so stretched. At this stage, I had... Um, bought out my business partner with you know if you say buy out it was basically like a handshake I wouldn't say we had any money at the time but um, but I remember a defining moment of being in the office my office here now and sitting there and just the relief of having everything gone and having one thing to focus on oh, man. Um, and that was like it was like a eureka moment like everything like I said, this is all supposed to happen. I'm here by myself now. And I, you know what I started doing? I picked up the phone and started ringing people. Was well, that's what I was good at. <laughs> oh, um, and um, to tell you if Dublin Barista School from 2015 to 2021 is, geez, what's well, a completely different business. But um, we, we doubled our revenue year on year and year. Um, and... Uh, you know, 2021 is going to be our biggest year. We're going to train about 15,000 people. Um, wow. we're, we're definitely the biggest independent barista school in Europe. Um, Amazing. Uh, I would say that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're doing really well. And uh, what's the business comprised of? You know, one of the biggest, one of the great things I love about business is you can experiment. I'm hugely into experimentation. 
Mm -hmm. uh, what I haven't done in Dublin Breeze School is the question you should ask me because I've done absolutely everything here to see. <laughs> I, what, I, what I learned from the Mexican food business was I only had one revenue stream. I didn't have many options. I couldn't, yeah. when things were quiet, I didn't have something else to supplement that quiet period. Yeah. So I said, that's not happening to me again. I am building, building, building revenue streams. Um, and that's what I did. I have a coffee shop that builds, brings me a revenue stream. I have two, two classrooms here now in, in this location that brings me revenue streams. <clears throat> we have, we're, we're in over 100 plus uh, schools around Ireland at the moment that we're doing trainings with. That's another revenue stream. I have a virtual corporate events business. That's another revenue stream. I have a subscription coffee service. That's another revenue stream. Um, so when one's not working, something else is working. Worst case scenario, we have some money coming into the business. Fantastic. Um, and you know, that's been and like everything that I'm telling you here is I'm just putting into practice everything I learned from all those mistakes, all those Jesus, really difficult, stressful periods. And and honestly, my looking back, my wife was a saint. Um, to put up number one with a an absentee husband because I was gone all the time. Um, and then, and then when I was there, I was a cranky bastard. Like, um, so because I was, I was boozing a lot. I was hitting the drink quite heavily. Um, I was using alcohol as a crutch, um, to deal with my failures, my failings, essentially, if I look back to it, my first son was born in 2014, a very hazy memory, uh, horrible to admit of my, of those years, the earlier years with my, with my son and my daughter, because I, I've, I've uh, I gave up alcohol in 2017. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to, I, would, I, did, I didn't tell people I was an alcoholic or anything, but it's like, I still don't believe I'm, I'm an alcoholic per se, but there's definitely alcoholic tendencies um, could be the description. Um, and I, I woke up one day, I, I remember I was 2017, um, June, 2017, I was in Nurka in South of Spain with my family and I had my son and my, uh, my son uh, on, my, on my back and my, um, I took a selfie and I looked at myself and yeah and but like just like with business you know with life the best lessons come from our mistakes you know and that's how we grow and that's how we change how we develop and your business has shown all the signs of it but as have you you know and your lifestyle now is the result of those experiences that you would have had that you would deem as a mistake now, but for me, when I look at things, it's just as a learning curve and it's an experience and, you know, but the awareness, you mentioned it at the start of this talk, the self-awareness to know, right, this is now a corner that I'm going to turn as opposed to allowing this to progress any further, but amazing. amazing somebody, story. well, the, the, the turning point was, it was, it, was a, it was a breaking point and somebody had given me Tony Robbins to listen to. And he, something he said resonated with me. And I was like, I made a promise to myself that, you know, up until that point, I was, I wasn't anywhere near my potential. I was, no, I knew I, I know I have potential, you know, you have potential, but I was literally scraping the ground and, you know, I was doing all right at that stage. I started to get traction in business, but you know, I wasn't a good husband. I wasn't a great father. Um, you know, I was, I was falling into a lot of traps that people fall into. Um, and I just decided to change that day and, I have never looked back. Um, in 2018, I gave up alcohol. I'm off nearly four years. That, that changed my life unbelievably um, to the point where, like, my day today was I was up at five, went for a run, in for a half seven meeting, um, did, some, uh, did some productive work, went to the gym, uh, came back into town, had multiple meetings with our with our team, had a had a full team meeting, I'm, and I'm here now talking to you guys. Like, I wasn't able to do that. Do you know what I mean? I couldn't yeah, physically I... do it. Um, I'd be like a vegetable in the corner of the room. I've had to do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but um, but there's no there was no strategic thinking. Where are we going to be next year? What's our plan? Where what's our exit goal? Where like where are we going? Who are the key people we need to help us get there? What's, you know, like, you know, what's our business model even, you know, it's like, can you answer those simple questions? Um, and, you know, that's where we are now. Like in reality, like this business could be, will be um, very big. And, you know, it is at a very, very good stage in terms of its valuation where we are at the moment, where we're, we're strongly valued. Um, we have a great reoccurring revenue model within it. 
we have great people working in the company. <clears throat> um, they have a leader in me who's got his head screwed on now. Um, yeah. I'm not going to say I'm unbelievable at business, but I'm I'm knocking on the door or hammering, as they would say. And, you know, that's all you can do. Um, and, you know, you can create your habits and your systems and all the rest of it, which are really, really important. And, you know, doing those, uh, doing those things over and over again, it's repetition, you know, yeah. um, and doing those, doing the right things. I mean, going to the pub every day is not a, a good habit. Um, no, for sure it's not. For sure it's not. So, yes, um, <clears throat> that's where we are now, like in a really positive state. And I have to say COVID-19 lockdowns were, you know, very, very good for us. We took advantage of it. Um, you know, we did a lot of deep thinking during that period, especially when we the first lockdown hit. And that was when we, we created <clears throat> two things. I created uh, Barista On Demand. Yeah. Um, which is, I, I, like, unbelievably, I would never admit or to anyone that this was actually going to be a business. I said, no way are people going to buy this. But we've Tell sold... What's, what is it on demand? Give us that. Barista On Demand is if you work in a corporate uh, environment and you are a member of a team somewhere, uh, say Google or Facebook or whoever, um, and you want to uh, do a team building experience, uh, you go to Barista On Demand and we will send you out a box to your house that contains coffee, coffee brewers, chocolate, all nice stuff. Um, I should have brought one up here, actually. I don't have one. Um, and then we meet on Zoom or Google Meets, and it's just been unbelievable. Um, we've sold thousands of them um, at wow. this stage. Um, like, we just were taking bookings with all the big tech companies, Google, Facebook, um, all these guys, and we uh, invested quite a lot into it. Not, like, huge financial, but, like, a bit of uh, financial investment. Um, but we've really focused on what, what have I learned from the years before? What do I have to do right here? So we have a studio, our own dedicated studio now, invested in all the equipment, camera, multi-camera angles, proper, you know, set up for an actual um, events company. Uh, we have hired a, like a videographer who works full time, um, create, not managing the actual experience, but also creating content for us, uh, doing other stuff. And we have some really good presenters. You know, um, and you know whether whether that will last, I don't know. But you know, it's it was a it was a reaction to COVID nineteen, and you know, it's been brilliant. So, the other thing that came out of it was our new mushroom coffee business. So, functional coffee space is going to be one of the biggest uh, growth areas in coffee over the next ten years. So, in April last year, I was like, <clears throat> "What happens if all of this fails? What happens if this?" if everything goes and I can't run this business anymore, I said, I need something. So obviously online, online uh, D2C, Shopify, um, Amazon are, is the way to go and it still is the way to go. Um, so we've created a, a brand that's, we haven't, I've soft sold it here in Ireland. Some of you guys who are watching may have noticed it um, oh, yeah. or may, may have come across it. Um, so it's mushroom, medicinal mushrooms mixed with coffee. It's got health benefits, unbelievable health benefits. I've been taking it now for about two years. Um, and I concocted, you know, there's no one really doing it in Europe. Um, and that's where we started. So I partnered up with two guys, two experienced um, uh, guys. Not, they're not in coffee, they're, they're money guys. And we've uh, built a brand and we're, it's going to be launching in January, probably. I'm gonna, it's called Oil, O-Y-L, Optimize Your Life. Um, so it's a reflection of what I'm doing in my life. It's a reflection of my passion, uh, my passions in health and fitness. <clears throat> and uh, obviously coffee as well. And seeing spotting trends and spotting long-term trends of what's happening and the functional space is, is going to be a big one, we think. And we're not just, we just, we don't want to be a local business. We want to be a global business. And that's what we're building. And like, you know, I'm 12 years in business and we made the biggest rookie mistake ever. Um, we had paid a guy, say like five grand to do our branding and everything. Um, beautiful brand it was called up up that's actually my handle on this uh, thing you saw um it doesn't exist anymore now and we we didn't no we were going didn't to get... when you gave it to the webinar james no wonder i didn't recognize it yeah. <laughs> and we were and we went to a trademark lawyer to trademark the name and uh, the name was already taken by target in the us and if we had proceeded with that name we probably would have been sued and um down six months or 18 months down the line 
So we have to change everything. Um, and that's where we are right now, actually. So like, and the beautiful thing about business today and about you guys who are watching, maybe who are, who are interested in business, who are studying right now, who want to know how to start. I mean, like it's actually never been easier to start. I could start a D to C business without leaving my house. Um, that's how easy, I don't have to touch a product. I can get everything made for me. I can get everything shipped for me. I can get everything uh, housed, uh, fulfilled for me and stored for me. And I can, I can you know, obviously you need money to do that, but um, you know, you need a small capital investment, you know, going back to that 500 euro, you know, I, I, a 500 euro and I, you know, anytime I'm doing talks, like I've never in 12 years, I've never borrowed a penny. Um, I've, that 500 euro has rolled into all these different things that I've been experimenting with and growing Dublin Barista School. Everything has come from cash flow. Um, we don't even have a company credit card. Um, that is so so everything is, uh, um, and that's obviously le a learning that I that I acquired somewhere down the line that I don't want debt. I just don't yeah. want debt because debt to me is not good. Obviously yes. there are instances where you need debt to grow your yes. business. I understand that. And, I, and I'm not scared of debt anymore. Like I will take it on when the, when the moment is right. Yeah. Um, but I suppose really the last 12 years has been learning. It's been a learning experience, learning about business, um, learning about myself. Um, and, you know, like I'm planning, I'm planning for like, I'm 41 now. I'm planning uh, for 50. I'm saying, who am I going to be at 50? What am I going to be doing at 50? I know exactly what am I, what I'm going to be doing when I'm 50. Ask, ask that question 10 years ago. I wouldn't have yeah. known. The growth, um, the growth that you've experienced over the last 10 years and even without trying without even planning i guarantee that growth will happen again but if you plan and you put scaffolds on that you know you'll be whoever you want to be at 50 i've no doubt yeah i mean there's a couple of questions you sent me um in the email when you know that you're going to ask me but like one of the, there's a couple of big things that were huge fulcrums um and change and one of them was um uh, uh letting your guard down, um, becoming a little bit more humble and going searching for help. Um, and that's what I started doing. And I would like, that's probably it's one of the reasons why we're talking here now, like when we connected after the first TES and we like, we met and uh, we networked one-on-one uh, yeah. -on -one and we were, you know, I know we were due to go for a run and all that, but never materialized. Yeah. Was awesome. Was awesome. Um, but like one of the biggest changes was letting your guard down and finding a mentor, finding like-minded people in, who are going to help you, who are going to help push you on. Um, like that meeting I was at this morning was with Gary Fox. Some of you, you'll probably know him, but I think he's done talks with you before. He's got the entrepreneur experiment. But like we just connect, we talk about business, we talk about life. Um, he pushes me, I pushes him. I have, I, have a mentor, I have a mentor as well, a really successful business mentor who, who actually, I, I send him my quarterly goals um, and he meets me every quarter and see did, did I hit the goals and puts me under some pressure. But all, all of these, that is, has been really, really uh, transformative, meeting those people where they connect you, they connect you, they connect you with other people. Um, and it's all about connecting. Um, like even having um, David McKern and on, uh, like I wanted him on my podcast when I started a podcast last year, he came on it and he's become like, a, I would say he's become uh, a mentor style a slash advisor for me. Um, really, really open guy. He sold his company for 30 plus million. Um, wealth of experience. And I can call him on, mob, on his mobile now and he'll answer it. And I'll say, here, David, I have a question. Do you mind? You know, and that's the type of person you, they're the type of people you need in your life. Um, yeah. The guys who are driving you forward. And, and it's not just, it's, it's high level and lower level. And also then uh, the guys who are coming up um, to be able to give back as much yeah. as you can without, you know, uh, thinking you're, you're a legend or a hero or something. But, but you're not, like, the thing is you're doing that right now with humility and openness and authenticity. And you're not here to impress anybody, but you're helping for sure. And if you're impressing as well, so be it. But you're helping. Ah, yeah. Do you know what? Like, I mean, in, in business, it's and what I'm saying, get to know yourself. I mean, there was one amazing uh, thing Matthew McConaughey did when he won the um, Best Actor Award. Um, I think it was at that when he won it, when he was talking about who he looks up to the most. And he ended up talking about he was looking up to his future self the most. And yeah. it was kind of inspiring because once you forget about everybody else and start focusing on yourself, like your life changes for sure. 
And when I'm getting up at 5 a.m. or 5.30 a.m. in the morning, I'm not getting up to impress somebody. I'm getting up because I want to get up and I want to go up and run up a mountain. I mean, that's probably because I'm a little bit weird. Um, no, it's no but, one adds value to the rest of your day. And you're the most productive version yeah. of yourself once that's done. And, uh, but I'm not doing it to uh, tell anyone I'm, I'm amazing or anything. You're just doing it for yourself and to maximize your day, get the most out of it. And that's very, very satisfying. Um, and also for me, like everyone's different, like I have two young children, I want to be the best version for them. I want them to experience somebody in their prime who's given it at 100%. Um, for, for them to, to, to have that role model, you know? Yeah. Oh, man. Um, and, and that's immensely important to me. And um, yeah. You're doing it, mate. Mm -hmm. doing it. Well done you, James. Well done you. And look. I can only speak for myself, but I got so much from that again. And even though I was, <laughs> attended a talk of yours three years ago, again, inspiring and authenticity, genuine, realness, it's rare. People like you and people that speak like this, it's just rare. So I really appreciate it. Now, I am going to open questions to the floor shortly. So anybody that's in the room, if you have a question, have a think, and we might put it into the text box in a second. Um, but I have one last question for you. So there are, you know, Everybody in this room now has the potential to go into corporate world or go and take a job when they graduate. And you did it, and I did it. Um, and now we find ourselves in an entrepreneurial space, and now that's where you're at. If you were to give advice to students, like what is the what is the positives of being an entrepreneur or being self-employed or being doing your own thing? What would be like the top three things, or you know, what sort of advice would you give around that if people had the option? Yeah, I think I think society programs us to believe that it's very risky to run your to be in control of your own life. Um, but I suppose there is there is an element of risk to it. But you know there is also an element, a huge element of freedom uh, to it. And I think for me, I am a personality type that needs to be in control of my own life one hundred percent. I don't like giving up control and I didn't like it when I was working in the corporate world I didn't like being told what to do uh, mm -hmm. necessarily yeah. um, and uh, so it really creates if you want to if you want to be that person like I mean you can have massively successful careers in corporate don't get me wrong I, I'm just mm -hmm. not a corporate style person even though I work with a huge amount of corporates and I can connect with them yeah. um, at, at, at any level I hope um, but it's that freedom to create freedom to make decisions freedom to um, experiment uh, freedom to you know choose what you want to do and make it happen um, and I think that's very very powerful and you don't often get that in a corporate world you're kind of you're you're, you're on more of a leash you're you're hitting more ceilings I can do whatever I want and do you know what you know that doesn't mean I can go and do what I want uh, I have a very, you know, normal, uh, rigid, kind of structured day, um, but that's what I enjoy. I, I enjoy that I can get up early and I, I enjoy being there for the kids in the morning when, I, when I'm able to, which is most mornings. That's a rule I set for myself <clears throat> um, because I have other people who are coming in to open up our business and to, to do all the things that need to be done within the business. I don't need to be there anymore um and, and that's and that's powerful and again you know that just frees I, this is that's not an ego statement that's allows to free me up to create even more um yeah so where so where am i going to be when i'm 50 <clears throat> i'm going to have multiple multiple brands multiple businesses i'm probably not going to be really working in many of them uh, directly um but you know that's that's the vision now that vision may change but um it's about, it's creating a formula and um, an understanding what the different levels are that are involved in getting and reaching the next level. Because for the last twelve years, I've been I've been at the the, the coal face, um, learning and you know chipping away, failing failing a huge amount, um, picking myself up, dusting myself off, getting over my ego uh, issues, um, and moving forward and that is one of the, the things that you find it's not easy but the benefits are just they're, they're amazing um the second thing i would say is having that well it's probably i created with the freedom thing but it's to um be able to have greater control over your future um you know i am more defined in where i'm going now 
um, yeah. and I know where I'm going, and I know anything is possible. You know, the 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 glass ceilings aren't here for me. There's no glass ceilings where I am, but I do know that it's going to just it takes it takes time, and I can't get there straight away. Um, so. Um, it's, it's again going back to the self-awareness piece where you have to enjoy all of these moments that, that are leading up to the place that you were eventually want to get to. Um, and I have control over that. So I control what books I read. I control what social media I consume. Um, I choose and control all these things that are going to help me reach the goals, the long-term goals that I have. Right. Um, and then the other thing is it's, getting a joy out of the day-to-day -day life of you're constantly learning every single second um <clears throat> even from that trademarking issue i was talking to you about um yeah. like saying what a rookie mistake you think at this stage we'd be on top of this type of stuff to to going out and teaching transition your kids and being amazed by them and um so learning of, i love that just learning you know yeah just, yeah just, just learning I, lo I love learning and you know i love reading um i love getting better i love improving i love i love all of that i love and that's what you get in on, from entrepreneurship of course you can get that anywhere else really but it's harder, harder because what you said there about the control uh, of your own life and it's hard to do in the corporate world where you're expected to 12 hour shifts in the office when you're an entrepreneur, you would still do 12 hours, but you know that's just as productive as being at the desk. They still count as work hours. So I'm with you, mate. I'm with you. Yeah, it's just balancing. It's a balancing act. I mean, um, you know, like you have to listen to your body. You have to listen to your own body because when you're when you feel like you're burning out, it's because you are burning out. Um, and, yeah. you know, when you're feeling sore after a workout, it's because you are sore after a workout. You need to rest. <laughs> yeah. um, when you're feeling, when you're feeling, when you're, when you're pissed off and in a bad mood, it's probably because you know you're dehydrated, or you you're, you just you know you, you just have to understand yourself and figure the, all the, all the stuff out. Um, and you know that's part of the fun. You know, like I go yeah. to a psych. I go like I'll openly I say I go to a psychotherapist uh, with my wife um, uh, nearly every week. And do you know what? It's not about it's not it's not about marital problems. Or it's not about any issues that I have with Linda. It's actually about getting to know each other better and about how can we actually have a better relationship and how can we become better parents by understanding each other more. So like when I when I snap at Linda at home in the kitchen, she, she now knows it's not about her. It's, it's about me. It's about yes, yes. some shit that I, I can't process or whatever it is. Yeah, and that's yeah. actually and that's actually broken a huge barrier. <laughs> for me in the business world in terms of whenever I see people getting angry in, in business or if I see a staff member I can sense when they're getting anxious or stressed out I, I feel it often and I'm able to react now in a more um, you know maybe humble kind of way or no humble is the wrong word understanding um, empathy, understanding way. empathy that's the word empathy <laughs> <laughs> no, like we all reacted we all have a short fuse sometimes with and we've all responded and regretted and somebody responds in a way that they will regret you understand and look it is what it is and um, now james i do have questions from the floor now so we're going to try to click through these because i don't want to keep you longer than i absolutely have to but there's a few now lower, go for statements, lower statements best talk of the year thank you so much for your time the road, like and the roadblocks to explicitly went through are going to be so valuable and donica also so it absolutely wasn't the last talk still loved it so that's all the positivity we have a few questions so I'm going to paraphrase these as much as I can. The first question was from somebody that was curious about how do you run a sandwich business and a coffee business and managing the logistics of the raw materials. So ordering in the raw materials to make the sandwiches, how, do you, how can you be sure that you're going to meet the supply and pay for the raw materials? Um, how did you manage that at the time? Well, it's, it's very tight at the beginning, especially if you're starting out with very little money. Um, so you, I did a huge amount of research on, it was actually hilarious now when I look back, huge amount of research on suppliers and everything. And I actually went to them before I'd even like started trading. I said, I need a discount on this. <laughs> um, so I was good at, I was good at negotiating even before I'd made a penny. Um, but like that's that's not even the point. Like a lot of these guys in in this industry won't give you any credit. Uh, you'll get no credit, so you'll have to pay 
up front for everything. Um, and that's where you'll need that. But like that 500 euro, uh, I think 50% of it went on raw materials, maybe even more, maybe. Um, and then how do I know how to manage it? Like it's very, very delicate because of food business. You only get really two days, kind of to three days max um, shelf life from products. So you have to make sure you're good at selling. Um, you have to go out there and sell the products to make some cash to uh, buy more stock, to make more cash, to buy more stock, to, to make more cash. And, and that cycle continues and continues. And then at the end of the year, if you're lucky enough, you make a, a profit. I mean, the like restaurants are very, very difficult to make money in. <clears throat> you're talking about if you're doing really, really well, you're going to make 15% net profit. But the reality is in this industry, you're you're at one, two, zero percent, five percent, ten percent if you're doing really well. It's a notoriously difficult business. And that's why when you come into any of my businesses anymore, I don't make sandwiches <laughs> or I don't run a food business because it's really, really difficult. Um, and you have to get a lot of things right. But like I, I did, I, I got a lot of things right in that sandwich business. And one of the key things I got right was fresh bread every single day. I never uh, used two day old bread, fresh bread. So, But you, after a while, it's like, how much of you should you order of anything? You should always order a little bit more than you think. Um, but that's very difficult when you're opening up because you don't know, you have no idea what you're going to sell. To give you an example, in our Mexican food business, when we first opened, we sold out the first four weekends in a row out of food, completely out of food. We had to close. Um, that's how busy we were. We were unbelievably busy. Um, and we ran out of food. And we're like, how does this keep on happening every weekend? How can we not plan better? Um, it's just because... Like our food was really, really good. Um, we just weren't very good at managing, but our food was really good and people liked it. And the, 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 the word spread and we were like, ah, oh, it was crazy. But it's difficult, but like it, it is fun. I, I thrive in that, that pressurized situation uh, in hospitality where everything has to be done quick. You have limited time. I love that personally because you have to react. You have to make quick decisions. And, you know, some people crumble i just i loved it i i was flying around the city at you know 6 a.m in the morning to deliver sandwiches and breakfast and all this type of stuff <laughs> that's fun to um, next question uh so what advice would you give primary piece of advice just one piece of advice for a budding entrepreneur in the fewest amount of words possible a little question um uh, what piece of advice experiment uh there's lots of pieces of advice but just experiment um give yourself a test give yourself 500 euros and start a business um you can do it it's very very easy um nice. i say easy i say easy but you know just start ask your dad or mom for 500 <laughs> euro and say you're going to start a business and and give yourself parameters you have to start that business from your bedroom and you can't leave it next question so, industry 10 years time like one of the biggest you know the, the, the best industry to be in 10 years time in your humble opinion um Probably the biggest growth right now and moving in towards that 10 year um, space is going to be D2C, which is direct to consumer, um, Shopify um, and Amazon, that joint. That's where that's what it's looking like at the moment anyway. So Shopify is actually bigger than Amazon as a whole with all the Shopify payments. So selling products online um, directly to consumer. And, and I think that's the new world order uh, wants us to do as well. Um, so um, they want us to be uh, buying online. They want to be able to control the logistics. They want to be able to analyze all the data. Um, and I suppose, you know, it's an ideal kind of uh, way of doing business really, because as I was saying, you can start a business from your bedroom. You don't have to even touch the product, although I would advise touching the product. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. Interesting. Great answer, James. And I'm with you on that one. You're telling me the shop for you is worth it. All right. Uh, next and on for to last question, guys. I know we've got loads coming in and James is a very popular speaker, but we have one last question. So, okay. so we're hearing a lot that firms and big corporates are trying to develop this culture of innovation. Entrepreneurship is what I'm reading. That, you know, within corporate organizations, trying to encourage this culture of innovation, enterprise, thinking outside the box within an organization. What would you deem as the most important things for developing that culture within? What, what categories is a culture that would encourage um, yeah. this innovative, innovative it's, culture? It's a, a, a decentralized um, management structure probably is, is what leads to it. I mean, you, from my experience, if you want to promote um, 
if you want to promote that kind of entrepreneurship, it's very, very difficult. Um, if you're not hiring top talent within your company um, and then be willing to give them free reign, um, essentially what it is, it's like it's just a bigger company investing in a startup and saying, hey, I think you're the man for the job. You, you run the company. Um, and if it, if it fails, we lose some money. If it goes well, we, we make a loads of money. Um, nice. So I think, I, think it's, I think it's a smart thing because I think there's a huge amount of smart people out there and with brilliant ideas. And you know, these, these companies who are able to afford to do it, I, I think it's, it's a great way of, of creating brilliant ideas that they would never think about themselves, probably. Um, probably look at Google as an example. Um, all of the unbelievable, all the unbelievable products that they've created, um, you know, but you have to be in a position to be able to pay top talent and to be able to, you know, be willing to lose a lot of money in the short term for a longer term gain. Um, yeah. Once obviously they believe the direction they're going in is the right one. So, you know, you have the lean, uh, you've all probably, or most of you have probably read the lean. You know what I mean? That's a lot of those bigger, I'm just taking off ear pods here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah, so like, you know, it's, it's like starting up a lean startup kind of model is very, very popular in these things, but like some of these companies are billion dollar companies, you know, who've, who've got like so much money to throw at things. Um, I mean, look at, look at the amount of money Apple wasted over the years with multiple different product fails. Um, but you know, they're still the biggest company in the world. So, I mean, they can afford to do that. See, that's it. It's no losing, really. It's no mistakes. It's all learning. And the more you can make, the better position you'll be in, as we know. Like, I'll be honest, like for a company like us, um, you know, we are a seven, small seven-figure company. Like, it's still difficult for us to um, have that. We couldn't actually afford to do that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, very so I'll just take 250 grand out of the bank. Um, there you go. You just mess around with it and let's hope that it's a it's a success um oh. only when you get to a massive level can you do it but you know not, one day. not when you get to a massive level when you get to a massive level i can't wait to see what you come up with it's like the dublin versus school now last question and this is from me and it's not much of a question so it's like if anybody on this call would like to reach out to james um monday entrepreneur or dublin versus school where can we find you online what's the best method of approach and for communication from anybody who wants to reach out yeah, um, James at Dublin Barista School .ie, or you'll find me on Instagram, uh, The Modern Day Entrepreneur. Um, and yeah, and you know, do you want my mobile number as well? Or <laughs> <laughs> I can pass that on. I'll pass that on. I'll put that in notes afterwards. You'll be getting some calls now. Right, James, look, an absolute pleasure and you know i'm not surprised in the slightest but we've got so much from that and i just want to thank you so much because we're all learning and we're all trying to learn from your experience and your experience from anybody who comes on but that was a very worthwhile hour for us as a society so thanks again for your just time. like just like i offered before if anyone wants to come up and talk um my money up the road for me um if you're coming to town i'm here most days just drop me a message and, <clears throat> and do guys do i availed that offer three years ago I know I have a friend that I go running with and reach out to and ask to come on talks like this. I and can't believe, believe it's three years. It's crazy. Three years, mate. Three years. It was my first year with the society, I think. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, time flies. I actually, I actually do business with a lot of people from that group. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I do business. Um, Why wouldn't you? Why Caroline and, and we, we are the best. Yeah, Caroline, I do a lot of. Uh, she does a lot of training with us. Caroline, who runs Aisht. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, she's great. She comes in and does our team training and uh, really, really good. <clears throat> yeah. And, you know, and there's, there's others as well. It's all good. What comes around goes around, you know? That's it. Exactly, mate. And we're stronger together. We all help each other out. But you've helped me out in a big way this evening, so I appreciate it. I won't take any more of your time. We've gone seven minutes over, and that upsets me, uh, just because I'm a bit pedantic when it comes to things like that. <laughs> James, go enjoy your evening. Go have a lie down. You've had a long day, but thank you so much. Cool. Right, thanks very much. Cheers. Appreciate it. Cheers. We'll chat to you again soon. I get a lot of thank yous in here. So thanks a million.